Welcome to a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Today, we will be bringing you an in-depth analysis of the 2023 Alberta Provincial Campaign. As the dust settles and the voters head to the polls on Monday, it's time to take a closer look at the platforms presented by the major political parties and examine the issues raised by both the Alberta municipalities and the rural municipalities of Alberta during this intense election campaign. And now joining us for this crucial discussion is a familiar face to the show, Jennifer Burgess. Jennifer, it is a pleasure to have you back on the show, but this time in your new role as a political pundit for the Cross Border <laughs> Interviews. Jennifer, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me, Chris. Uh, I'm excited to uh, dissect this with you. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, but I want to talk right now about how it's been a kind of a remarkable journey. I can't believe that this started May 1st, and we are literally two days away from finding out who the next government is going to be, with each party striving to present their vision for Alberta's future. Uh, but throughout this campaign, there were significant concerns raised by Alberta municipalities and the rural municipalities of Alberta. Now, these issues captured the attentions of citizens across the province, or have they? They, uh, The two organizations have demanded thoughtful consideration and discussion on their platforms. Now, have they fallen on deaf ears when it comes to the major political parties? Jennifer and I are about to discuss that. And the concerns raised by the municipalities are essential in shaping the policies that will impact the lives of everyday Albertans, from economic growth to infrastructure development, from healthcare accessibility to community safety. These are just a few of the pressing issue matters that we will be discussing today. Now, we are aiming to bring you comprehensive review of all the major political party platforms dissecting their promises and examining how they will align with the interests and needs of Alberta municipalities and rural communities. Jennifer, as someone who has been in the political realm uh, and deeply involved in the political landscape, what were your initial thoughts on the platforms presented to you by the two major parties, the UCP and the NDP? Yeah, it's been, um, you know, quite an unusual election. You know, I have been around a while. I won't age myself and give dates, but I've seen a few elections in my days. And um, it's been such an interesting period in Alberta. This is like kind of our first horse race, you know, where we have not only two parties who could both win, but um, two parties that are kind of going after the same demographic. You know, they're both heavily targeting Calgary. They both, you know, clearly have this sort of like middle swing vote in mind. Um, and so in that way, it makes it kind of hard to get these really specific issues on the agenda because they are being so targeted and who they're talking to. Um, but, uh, you know, what stood out to me is I think there is uh, some clarity that what's gonna happen after the election is that no matter who wins, these, both these parties are going to need some friends, <laughs> um, well, no matter what the seat count looks like. So I, I think there's a bit of um, a bit of thinking ahead too, and you know you're trying to get votes obviously, but you're trying to get votes from a very specific demographic. So I think a lot of these platforms too are are thinking ahead to you know who are we who are we going to need to help build after May 29th. <laughs> Now, one of the yeah. things that I, I have been sort of hammering against at the onset of this campaign was how heavily focused it would be for Calgary. Uh, we have seen the party leaders here in Calgary on a regular basis, but uh, Alberta municipalities and the rural municipalities of Alberta have basically said, well, with Alberta municipalities saying, think uh, Alberta, vote local. Um, do you think this election did a disservice to communities and municipalities outside of the larger urban centers and i say urban centers and i mean uh red deer lethbridge edmonton calgary because i didn't see a lot of uh political parties in the village of alex or the village of coronation <laughs> yeah. so do you think it did a disservice to smaller rural municipalities yeah i mean i think chris that that will be seen after the election because i think how a party presents itself during election time and how they actually govern are two different things. And so <laughs> I think I've, you know, I've got my eye, especially at one party, especially who is very focused on Calgary, but you know, is traditionally stronger in rural areas. And I think we'll probably be, you know, looking to represent them and um, engage with them pretty heavily after the election. So I think it waits to be seen. I think it does pause a challenge though to the, the larger like conversation about elections and that it be it forgets that we, we are electing representatives for the entire province. Um, and we do get these very specific issues. Like, you know, I'm, I'm based in Calgary, just like you are and like the arena deal took up like so much 
space in the political conversation, but it's so specific. And when you think about, you know, all those towns you listed around the province, they all need arenas. A lot of arenas are, you know, critical infrastructure everywhere. Um, and so I think it, um, it does pose a broader challenge to, you know, the sort of the, the democratic process, these kinds of elections where we have to remember that this government represents the entire province and not just where they're trying to get votes. Now, before we jump into the yeah. platforms and the policies yeah. and the uh, promises that each of the parties have uh, given to municipalities, uh, one of the big things that happened during this election was the Alberta wildfire season sort of started yeah. off with a massive bang. Uh, it took away the first week of the campaign and almost even the second week of the campaign where we saw the political leaders basically working together in a weird, unified way that we haven't <laughs> seen in a political campaign. Do you think that week of the campaign kind of didn't hurt the election season but it changed the way that the remaining uh election happened compared to if the elect uh, wildfires hadn't happened because i look at it and i think to myself if those wildfires hadn't happened we wouldn't have had that photo with rachel notley and uh, premier smith in uh, the premier's office we wouldn't have had the the two going out and meeting with evacuees from uh, communities across northern alberta i i just don't see how that would have pl- how how the election would have played out if we didn't have that yeah yeah that's a really good point it was uh, it was quite a disruption i think you know for both the campaigns um you know not uh, not any more so than it was for the people who were actually evacuated <laughs> from fire and i think you know that's what i think about actually i think about less about the, the narrative and like the the marketing of the campaign the more how it's going to impact people actually voting in those areas you know i i put myself in their place where i was very lucky to be in somewhere safe but i had a family who lives up north in edson and um they had to evacuate, take their kids, take their cats. To, you know, they were driving to Jasper, like in the middle of the mountains. And it's very stressful. So I, I imagine for them, the last thing on their minds is voting <laughs> right now, you know. Um, and but some it, of those people still haven't gotten home. Yeah. And, but it does sound like they are slowly letting people back into their slowly, communities. Yeah. I, I know Fox Creek, I, I just was reading a social media post from last night, if I'm not mistaken, that businesses are starting up, uh, the emergency services yeah. are back in there. So I'm very happy that things slowly. are progressing into a way that people are actually getting back into their homes. And uh, our thoughts yeah. are with the people who were displaced and are going back to uh, potentially no home at all, because we do realize okay. that there are people who have lost their communities. Um, But I want to turn to the platforms now. And before I start that, I want to say that this is going to be a unique episode because we're going to be dividing this into a few different segments here. And the first segment, we're going to be focusing on the United Conservative Party led by Premier Daniel Smith or leader Daniel Smith, I should say, uh, because she is well premier. She's the leader of the Conservative Party of Alberta. I want to start with this. You've read the platform. I've read the platform. Um, it's the one party that I tried to find an actual document that I could print off and read through, but it seems like the platform documents are not what the UCP wanted. They went for a more website, user-friendly media release uh, platform. Um, When reading it, Jennifer, did you find anything in there that stood out when it came to the just overarching theme of the Alberta municipalities and rural municipalities of Alberta's campaigns that they were launched? Yeah, um, I will frankly say no, (laughs) I didn't. (laughs) Um, But I don't think that's a surprise. I mean, these platform documents have become more kind of like campaign material now than they really have policy documents I've noticed over the last few elections and I'm sure you have too they become kind of less and less in depth and a bit more about messaging and flashy photos so that's not a surprise um I think that the UCP is in a tough spot because the previous premier made a lot of changes to uh, health care that did not go well over you know especially in rural areas and even in Calgary actually with like changes to the the ambulance distribution system and um some policies like that so um they're in a tough spot where they have to kind of pivot away from that Um, But they also have to recognize that healthcare is huge on everyone's mind. I mean, I think that's the issue across the province. I would imagine I'm no pollster, but I imagine it comes up everywhere. (laughs) It doesn't matter where you are. It's a concern for people. So they have to address it. Um, What I did notice in the UCP's platform is interesting is they they're very much trying to tie this line through all their platform about um, taxes. And how they managed to bring all their policy pieces back to taxes. And I don't have a good sense on, you know, how a municipality 
like some of the ones you listed, you know, not just like Calgary, Edmonton, but some of the smaller ones would feel about that. Um, I don't know if it speaks to them because it doesn't come up, you know, in their own platforms, but that seems to be what the UCP kind of kept trying to take the healthcare discussion back to is we're not going to raise taxes, but we're going to get more doctors. Now on the website yeah. that I, the, on the UCP website, when I was reading and reviewing it, um, it seems like they were listing their accomplishments a lot, but they weren't listing what they wanted to do when, a, if reelected on May 29th. Now, um, I will say that Alberta municipalities did reach out to both of the major parties and asked for their uh, thoughts and concerns on, or thoughts on the uh, Think Alberta Vote Local campaign that the organization put forward. Uh, from what I understand, uh, there was supposed to be a letter from the UCP to Alberta municipalities. Now, as of recording this Saturday morning before the election, I had checked the website and there was no okay. UCP letter from the uh, to the an open letter to Alberta municipality so i can't confirm or deny if this letter was actually supposed to happen but from a conversation via twitter uh to me through alberta municipalities uh there was supposed to be a letter before the election date it may still come right. to later on today or tomorrow but i can only judge this platform based on what i see on their website and for what i saw when it comes to just healthcare as a whole um it was more about the what we've done and what we're like not what we're going to be doing and now they did talk about their uh healthcare guarantee which we all remember that big giant healthcare card uh in uh, Spruce Grove where Daniel Smith said no one will have to pay for healthcare unlike what the NDP have said but that's relatively the only thing they talked about for health care. Yes, there have been some gaffes from some uh, candidates for the UCP talking about uh, charging it to a credit card. But overall, health care wasn't a big topic for the UCP. Is it because, like you said, Jennifer, the previous governments with their handling of the healthcare file during the pandemic, it kind of is a third rail for them. They don't want to touch it because if they do, people will remember that there was lockdowns, people's surgeries had to be canceled. Yeah, I think that's definitely a big piece of it. Um, it's, um, you know, it's a complex file. It's probably one of the most complex ones in the provincial government. Um, and, you know, we've seen we've seen in the past the challenges these conservative governments have had with big boards like AHS. And so I think it's it's a tough one to campaign on for the UCP, for sure. Yeah, I made had to make yeah. sure I unmuted myself after I coughed there. I want to turn to crime, though, because this yeah. government and this party really focused on crime and uh, safe community safety uh they made numerous announcements in downtown calgary downtown edmonton about putting more sheriffs on the streets uh they did have an extensive uh, platform policy around this uh about recognizing the rising crime rates and incidents of violence in alberta alberta and they wanted to prioritize safety of albertans across alberta but let's be honest and i i say this over and over again they really only mention El uh, Edmonton and Calgary. They don't mention other communities. And I'm 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 going to call a spade a spade here, but I'm pretty sure crime doesn't just happen in the two <laughs> large urban centers in Alberta. Shocker, right? <laughs> what were your thoughts on the uh, crime? Because this was yeah. This, Traditionally, conservatives are known for their tough on crime approach. Yeah. So you would assume that this would be a win win for Daniel Smith and the UCP. Yeah, yeah. this one is so interesting to me. Um, I felt like this was probably the UCP's one of their strongest platform pieces. It's clearly been, you know, pretty thought out. Daniel Smith is like, this is part of her leadership campaign. Like, she's thought about this quite a bit. Um, they have, you know, this is probably one of their most thorough pieces of policy. I think they have like some pretty clear actions that they're going to take. I was take, about to say the like exact same thing, Jennifer. <laughs> and, you know, it's nice in policy platforms to see some specific policy. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, what, what stood out to me about this, because I was thinking about it through the lens of, you know, we talked about Alberta municipalities and what they put forward. Um, and what's very clear in the Alberta unis like advocacy document is they don't want a provincial police force. <laughs> like they mentioned that a few times. <laughs> they're just like... We want to like, yeah, this has to go to a referendum. We don't want anything to do with it. And um, I, I listened to one of your previous interviews, Chris, and I can't remember which mayor it was, but he said something really interesting about crime and his 
city. And he said, you know, it doesn't matter what decal is on the car or is on the uniform. Um, that doesn't matter to us. We want to stop the crime happening. And so I think I, this policy piece, I feel like doesn't speak to that need as much. I think these small towns are saying they need prevention. Like, you know, they need to, uh, they need help with, you know, social workers and safe consumption sites. And um, they're, they're struggling with homelessness and issues like that, that I think, you know, come before you send them a whole bunch of police officers. And so to your point, I think this, you know, speaks to like upping police presence in Edmonton and Calgary. I don't think this speaks to like anywhere else in the province for that it doesn't really seem to be, it doesn't seem to be what they're asking for. And and on the yeah. flip side of that as well. Um, so Danielle Smith, Smith during her leadership campaign said we're, we'd we'd like to look at a provincial police force. Uh, rural municipalities and Alberta municipalities basically said, "Don't do it. We don't want it. We want to stick with the RCMP." Um, now, during the first few days of the election, or even I, I could be wrong. It could be in a, the few days before the official election call. Danielle Smith said, it's not going to be in our platform. We're not, we're not putting it in our platform. And uh, Trina Jones, the mayor of Legal in Alberta, just North of St. Albert said, if you don't have it in your platform, you better have a referendum if you're about to implement it afterwards, because I think that was the most oppressing thing I heard from Alberta municipalities is if you don't have it in your platform, you better hold a referendum because it is a big change. And it is, it is something that, is not just a simple vote in the legislature to change and understand governments have the right to do with it, with it, whatever they want. But if you're not putting in your platform or people are not uh, addressing it, you better make sure that you put it to a vote and have an actual substance uh, vote because we all saw what happened in the last municipal election with the referendums that the province had turnout was horrible and they still went for it with it. So there's my yeah. two cents on that one. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a uh, it's such an interesting one too to think about how like you know Jason Kenney kind of tried to push this forward a bit during his term, um, and he got pushed back because you know there are a lot of people who support them because they're supposed to be the sort of the fiscally responsible, um, you know, organization leadership, and this is a very expensive policy. This is a hugely expensive change. So Daniel Smith's going to have the same challenge. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I was very happy that the UCP actually put the word bail in the uh, their platform, because when I was reading, the first thing I did was I took out keywords that the Alberta municipalities and rural municipalities of Alberta wanted. And I mm. basically did a quick search in their websites. Some just did not show up. But for the Alberta UCP for the UCP, it did show up and I, I just want to make sure I, I mentioned that because this was a key thing that Alberta municipalities wanted was stopping that revolving door of repeat offenders getting out on bail every single time. So uh, they did mention it. So it is a win-win for Alberta municipalities having that little, even if it was just that one line that they only had, it yeah. was still a win that municipalities can say, okay, let's focus on that. I yep. want to turn to our last uh, question for municipalities, and it's around infrastructure. Now, I'm going to be blunt. There's a $30 billion deficit in infrastructure funding that municipalities are facing right now. Municipalities fix and take care of 60% of infrastructure across this province. 60% of the infrastructure that you use, roads, uh, water, uh, pipes, all are KP, um, the majority are being taken care of, but taken care of by municipalities. Yeah. I went through the UCP document. There's not much when it comes to infrastructure in the future. It's all about what we've done. And I, I joked with you prior to recording this, and I said it was all about the roads that they were improving in the communities. Does that go far enough for municipalities? Do you think when it, uh, when municipalities are looking for that thirty billion dollar deficit? Yeah, I would say not at all, Chris. In my opinion, and I think this kind of goes for just what every platform that we've looked at. Um, you know, infrastructure deficit is is a huge liability right now that the province is carrying. That it's going to have to address. Like this is there's a there's a timeline on these. You know, you can't just ignore it forever, and it's a, a continuing challenge. Um, these kind of projects. I you know I, I worked around infrastructure for quite a while, and it's it's not really like a, a fun sexy project for you know 
a government to come in and say, we upgraded your boilers or, you know, we built you a, a new furnace, <laughs> but it's like that kind of stuff that holds together communities, literally. Um, and I did see the UCP interestingly came out with something about rec centers recently, which seemed kind of very out of nowhere, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, uh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I saw that as well this morning yeah. and I was just double checking to make sure that Alberta municipalities hadn't posted a, a, a letter. And I, I read their platform once again. Yeah. And I was like, where did this come from? Because this was yeah. not here three days ago when no. I first read their platform. <laughs> yeah, it just came, uh, they just kind of announced it quietly a few days ago. So I think there's a bit of a recognition that, you know, you, you have to acknowledge that this is a huge issue for municipalities. Like you can't ignore it. Um, and, you know, once whoever becomes government, once they become government, that's going to be, you know, people are knocking on their doors because municipalities talk about things. That's what we're going to talk about is, you know, we need. We need a pool and you know infrastructure also includes like community schools and hospitals too it's uh, you know a huge piece of what the provincial government does to municipalities. well just so just on the rural municipalities say, yeah. as well it's about bridges because i know there's a lot yeah. of municipalities who deal with bridges and they're they're coming to their end of their lives because these bridges were built in the yeah. 50s and 40s and now they're coming to the end of their lives and you have to replace them and a bridge is not a uh, cheap thing to build these days i don't care who yeah. you are yeah and when i when i spoke to paul mclaughlin he had a perfect quote and i'm gonna probably butcher it right now but he basically said um the people of rural alberta are paying for that three mil three hundred million dollar arena deal why aren't the people of calgary paying for these bridge updates <laughs> and expecting uh something to happen in that realm and i went you're right if rural Alberta is paying for our arena, why aren't we paying for their bridges? It should be a one size fits all Alberta. F and I hate to use Alberta first because I know there's a party called out the Alberta first party, but there should be a thought process around everyone's in this together. And it's not rural versus urban or Calgary versus every single small community. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, if I, I think if Alberta Muni's is, you know, being a bit assertive, they could talk about even just, you know, the capital planning process is, is not great in this province, you know, and I think that's something no one wants to tackle, right? Like no one wants to talk about that, but it's, you know, if you ask. Is it's not sexy, right? Day, and I, yeah, I apologize, but it's not sexy. It's not a no. flashy new arena. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, somehow you've got to make these decisions that should be based on something besides which voter demographic you're trying to target. Call me crazy. Well, I, I would never do that. We'll be right back after a quick message, everyone. Uh, welcome back. We are just finishing up with the uh, United Conservative Party, and now we're going to be talking about the Alberta NDP's platform with regards to the Alberta Municipalities Think Alberta Vote Local campaign and the Rural Municipalities of Alberta rural, Uniquely Rural campaign. I'm going to mess that up every single time I say it, but here we are. Um, before we get into this, I want to just uh, have a little bit of a transparency uh, moment here. Uh, Jennifer uh, has appeared on the show before uh, in her capacity, in her previous capacity as a candidate for the Alberta NDP's nom uh, candidacy for Calgary Glenmore. So I just wanted to put that on the record before we jumped into that. So that way I'm not being accused of hiding things because I don't like that. So with that, I want to start with this. Uh, the Alberta NDP uh, did respond to Alberta municipalities with an open letter to all 275 members. The Alberta municipalities have posted it on their website. A link to that open letter will be in the show notes. And I should mention if the UCP do actually respond to the letter by the time this uh, goes to air, that link will be in the show notes as well. Um, so they did respond. They did outline the three areas that Alberta municipalities wanted to talk about, healthcare, infrastructure, and community safety. Jen, for you, what was your big takeaway in their platform for these three topics in an overarching question? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of healthcare, like no surprise, the NDP is pretty strong on talking about this topic. Um, and I think this is one area, I didn't feel like it's all their policy areas, but this is one area where it's really clear that they've been government. And I think that they they have their head kind of wrapped around to what all the different issues are in healthcare, because it is, like we alluded to earlier, just a beast of a policy file. Um, and so I did appreciate on their platform that they kind of address that, that there's a lot of facets to fixing healthcare. I feel like in the letter they sent Alberta Minis, they didn't lean into that as much as they could have. I kind of expected a bit more in like that healthcare area. 
agree with you on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, especially when it comes to doctors, like, I just feel like based on my, you know, totally non-scientific information, talking to people in small towns, like getting doctors in their town is just like probably the number one issue for a lot of people in those areas. And, you know, if I was the NDP, I would just go hard on, um, you know, I'm not saying this necessarily true, but like that they could build a narrative that the UCP drove doctors out of Alberta and we're going to bring them back. Um, I would be putting that on billboards all over small town Alberta. And I didn't, um, you know, I don't see that highlighted in this policy platform, which surprised me a bit. But, um, you know, I'd say in general, I think they they seem like they know what they're talking about. I'm just not sure if it's focused on what people are uh, wanting to hear. During the Alberta municipalities, uh, rural, oh, sorry, health care uh, press conference that they held last two, or actually literally Tuesday, the last Tuesday of the campaign. Um, the Summer Village, oh, I'm going to get this wrong. The mayor of the Summer Village of West Cove, Ren Giesbach, I apologize if I pronounced your name wrong again because I got emails from Alberta Municipalities <laughs> that I did during the actual, uh, 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 my show. Um, he mentioned, because he's a smaller, literally a small community, that this issue is not just a last four years issue about rural doctors mm. leaving rural communities and going to uh, larger urban centers. Um, and I'm not sure if that was the reason why they didn't lean into it, because there's always room mm. for improvement for all political parties. And I'm not saying this just because it's the NDP, but I think there's always room for improvements on things that you do good for the UCP. You just need to do better all the time. Mm -hmm. So when it came to addressing the doctor shortages in more rural communities and more smaller urban centers, I can imagine that the NDP wants to fix it, but they don't want to look at their quote unquote uh, record for also yep. seeing a uh, departure of rural communities into larger urban centers. And let's be honest, and I'm going to say this, rural doctors are more often just going to go five years, go work in a rural community, get their legs and then go into a larger yeah, urban maybe. center because that's where they want to raise their family. Yeah, no. And it's a, uh, it points to an interesting challenge to, uh, you know, both for Rachel Notley and Daniel Smith is they've both been in government, <laughs> or at least, you know, they've been premier and leader of the opposition. So it's, they both have some baggage that they both, you know, are avoiding and trying to highlight in a bit of an awkward dance sometimes. One of the areas that they did talk about at the Alberta NDP in that open letter and on their mm -hmm. website was they wanted to uh, address the issue faced by EMS workers and yeah. reduce the A, time but also reduce their sort of exhaustion and, and their experience that they're having while dealing with all these medical um, uh, calls this was a big thing for a lot of smaller rural communities when even going back to trina jones the mayor of legal in northern alberta and even ren giesbach the mayor of west of summer village of west cove they did mention that it could be an hour to two hours for sometimes to get a yeah. uh, EMS driver. Heck, even in Alberta, even in Calgary, one of the large, the largest city in the province, the wait time for an EMS can be half hour, 20, like 45 minutes. And that could mean life and death for some. So I, I didn't see a heavy focus in the UCP, but I did see a heavy focus on this even outside of the uh, open letter to Alberta municipalities, it was in their on their website. It was in their platform yeah. to talk about EMS. So I think that might win them some good graces yeah. with the Alberta municipalities and rural municipalities. Do you not agree? Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's a, a huge issue that would be at their peril um, to ignore. I do think, you know, to our, our previous conversation, it's a bit awkward because they were in government and they could have, made some fixes while they were there and also made some changes that maybe, you know, weren't effective. So it's, you know, also a bit of a tough dance for Rachel Notley, but um, you know, I think you, you can't talk about appealing to any, yeah, like you said, basically any center with the healthcare needs without talking about EMS right now. Yeah. One of the areas that the people wanted, uh, the Alberta municipalities wanted to, uh, the parties to focus on, it was nurse practitioners. And now yeah. only one from what I saw, and the, correct me if I'm wrong, and you probably you read what I read as well, but the yeah. only party that actually mentions nurse practitioners in their platform from what I read is the Alberta party. Does that give a sort of a little hit to the UCP and the Alberta NDP when it comes to even addressing issues around 
different ways we can give public publicly funded healthcare in these smaller communities who may not have a doctor or even a, a, a an on call doctor yeah. part time doctor yeah yeah no definitely um i yeah i was surprised not to see that in there either cuz that's a, also a great opportunity to work with post secondaries right and like do some boostering for our our economies and our talent attraction as well too so it's like it's like yeah like you said a kind of a win-win conversation really and the uh, rural Alberta, rural municipalities of alberta wants uh the province the next government to actually implement uh seats at the table for specifically for rural doctors they want yeah. to be able to have post-secondary education as uh, institutions have specific rural seats at there so if you go to post-secondary you go into a rural community and i think that is a excellent excellent yeah. idea because you you want to go to medical school let's go but you're going to be going to rural and we'll help with that in some sense and i i think it's a great initiative from the rural municipalities of alberta to even focus on that and it's mm -hmm. the thinking outside the boxes that municipalities do so well at right yeah 100%. No, no. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say 100% agree. <laughs> <laughs> I want to turn to the infrastructure deficit because I want to leave the the tough one for the NDP till last. And I want to talk about the $30 billion infrastructure deficit and the platform policies and pledges that the Alberta NDP have. Now, in their open letter, uh, the Alberta NDP, if they form government on Monday, will want to address the $30 billion infrastructure deficit, and they've proposed a comprehensive community investment. They plan to eliminate the small business tax, benefiting over 100,000 small businesses. The party also aims to support municipalities by offering an investment toolkit and incentives to attract business investment. Now, they don't, they, and I, I, I'm going to be blunt here, and I should say this as well, anyone who knows me knows that my my husband is the former NDP Minister of Tourism and Culture, Ricardo Miranda. So, And I, if you've listened to my show, you know I have some issues with the Alberta NDP when it comes to some of the policy platforms. In this open letter, they don't mention, they mention some of the things that they want to do, but they don't mention how they're going to fix the actual $30 billion infrastructure gap. And I think that's the big thing that no party wants to talk about. They're just basically saying, oh my gosh. you're going to do it all by yourself. Oh my gosh, Chris. It's so frustrating because <laughs> I, yeah, I read these platforms and, um, you know, the NDP platforms all about building things. We're going to build hospitals. We're going to build schools. And um, we have hospitals and we have schools and it's like they're, they're crumbling and that's like a horrifying thing for communities. And I think that's um, what I feel like is a bit of a disconnect between what Alberta Muniz is talking about, I think very clearly and what these platforms are talking about is they're saying like, well, don't worry, we'll give you some money and you can build a new thing. But like, that's not what Alberta Muniz is asking for. It's like they have really important community infrastructure that's been there for years that people are very attached to and that's been serving a purpose and it needs maintenance like any other piece of infrastructure and those are two different conversations that are happening and it's uh, it's really frustrating to see sometimes that that voice about you know needing ongoing maintenance just kind of try to be silenced all the time in these elections i'm gonna i'm, yeah. I'm gonna ask a stupid question right now and i want to get your opinion on it <laughs> do you think this is the topic that no party actually wants to talk about because by saying that there's a $30 billion deficit, that is a tangible number. That is a number that people can look at and say, okay, this is a serious concern. But no party wants to go near that with a 10-foot pole. And I go back to, I think it was the former... I think it was the former mayor of Calgary or the former mayor of Edmonton when I had them on the show. They said, the taxpayers in your community are the same taxpayers in the province and the same taxpayers yeah. in the federal. One taxpayer. Like, everyone yeah. has to work together. And it seems like these parties, and I'm not trying to like blindside both of them right now, but none of them want to come to the table to address this issue, even with the LGFF funding or the former MSI funding. Like mm -hmm. this, this, this is only going to get worse if this next government yeah. doesn't address it. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, I think it's a real opportunity for like organizations like Alberta Muniz and RMA to like leverage that collective voice they have. And I think they, they really need to be 
um, collaborative. And I think if I were in their position, I would be lobbying the government as one voice and saying, this is a problem. Like you need a strategic approach to this. Like we don't want you building infrastructure randomly depending on the election cycle. And like, you know, I alluded to earlier, it's really nerdy sounding, but I think, you know, having a clear process for a prioritized capital plan, like that's what I would put like top of my asks. Um, and just use that collective voice, you know? I don't know if you've ever been to like a, an AUMA convention or RMA convention, but like get them up in the bear pit and say, this is what we want. So, you know, I, I would yeah. like to see that. But let's be yeah. honest. I've been to some of those and sometimes it's not a bear pit. It's more, you're going to ask a yeah. question, just like question period. You're going to ask a question. Yeah. I'm going to answer a question. You did not ask. There's yeah. my, there's my random yeah. thought That's on that. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> give me a silver lining though. Because understandable, the Alberta uh, NDP probably want to address this issue, but it seems like there's only one real initiative that they put forward that really got attraction, and that's the community rink sort of proposal of building community facilities in the in individuals of fixing up rinks. We talked about how the UCP sort of slid it into their platform at the last mm -hmm. minute. But it wasn't really that much of a, uh, <laughs> a, pardon me, a main focus for theirs. But the NDP, I, I believe it was a former FCM president and candidate for Fort Saskatchewan, Beggarville, uh, Tanine Rudick, and I think Sherwood Park uh, candidate Bill Tanaka, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that name for the NDP, yeah. announced this community fund where they would be hopefully uh, – in uh, a, pr a program that would create 1500 jobs over three years to support municipalities and nonprofits in building, repairing, renovating, and expanding community facilities. Like, I, I don't go to hockey, I know you're a mother, so you probably go to a lot more facilities than I do. Are they in disrepair? Are these community <laughs> facilities in disrepair that this would be a big thing for smaller communities to say mm -hmm. that's a great winner for us? Some of them. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the challenge is it often depends on who your advocates are in the area. And there are certain communities who have people with the time and resources to advocate and some of them don't. So there's a, a concerning disparity there that, you know, I, I would like to see addressed and how this is distributed. Um, I will say the city of Calgary is very strong at this and looking at how they build their infrastructure. So, um, you know, if there is a future where the province and the city of Calgary are collaborating and these kinds of things. <laughs> Like on a 300 million <laughs> NHL arena deal? Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, see, they came to the same page for that one. So this would be a great area for them to work closely with municipalities on. The one thing that I think both parties sort of failed on, and I think we, we, we touched on it a bit, but I want to recap it one last time, is they're planning for the future, but not the past. So the Alberta NDP and the UCP are pledging that they're basically tying provincial revenue with how much municipalities will get, whether it be provincial revenues, uh, provi uh, sorry, the provincial revenues through oil and gas. And they both want to provide predictable revenue for local governments to invest in infrastructure. That's great. And I'm going to say this. <clears throat> That is perfectly acceptable to tie funding for municipalities to oil or sort of to, to provincial revenue. Revenue, yeah. That doesn't address the $30 billion deficit. <laughs> this yeah. is not something that you could just say, okay, a billion dollars for 200 and sorry, 345 municipalities across Alberta. That's not a lot for infrastructure funding and if it's a 30 billion dollar deficit now i'm not looking forward to seeing what it's next year so there's my last word on that do you have a last word on infrastructure before we turn to the ndp's third rail <laughs> <laughs> no i don't uh, i don't think i can top that chris i think it's uh you know something that i hope people think about when they're voting you know think about the infrastructure in your community and talk to your candidates about you know that's um something that i the leaders are talking about but if you live by a community school that's you know ha having danger of closing or if your community association is falling apart like you know ask people about it keep it on the radar so i want to turn to our last uh sort of question and sort of the topic that alberta municipalities and rural municipalities of alberta put forward and that is the idea of keeping community safe now we, I, I, I jokingly said that it's the third rail. Like the third rail for the UCP is healthcare. The third rail for the uh, 
uh, the NDP is community safety because it's not traditionally strong on crime because traditionally the NDP, the UCP are no, or the conservatives, I should say, are known the tough on crime stance. Yeah. Um, I didn't read much into this platform about community safety and putting, uh, hoping more, helping more people, whether it be through mental health initiatives, whether it be through uh, uh, sort of reforming the bail system. Did you, Jennifer, because I, I might have just missed it, but I, I thought I did an in-depth look at it. Yeah, no, it's pretty, it's pretty weak. And it's been interesting because it is, it has become an election issue, um, whether it's, you know, that's actually authentically coming from communities or it was fabricated, but it's, it is, it's a, you know, one of the ballot box questions we're talking about safety. The NDP has to talk about it, but um, it's a tough one for them to address because um, it's, you know, complex. Like we alluded to earlier, community safety is complex. If you talk to these community leaders, they'll tell you there's a whole bunch of things that need to be addressed and they're not the fun, sexy policies. <laughs> and like some of them relate to infrastructure deficits, right? Like it's, there's a lot going on there. So I don't, I think the NDP is just walking a, a difficult line here with what they're going to say. Um, but I will say like they could, this is one area where I expect them to talk a bit more about what they did, because they did do some some interesting things with supporting communities when they were government that I could, you know, this could help them, I think, fill in this gap a bit where they're trying to talk about something that they're not usually strong on. The, the, in the open letter, they do address it, but in the platform, they don't. Yeah. So I do want to take yeah. a moment and say sure. that in the in the open letter, they did mention it. Um so in the open letter, Alberta NDP leader Rachel Notley basically outlines that they want to restore the $32 million cut in municipal funding for policing that was implemented by the UCP government. Uh, they want to hire 150 new police officers and pair them with 150 social workers and mental health workers to form integrated teams that can address crime, particularly in transits and downtown areas. Now... <laughs> As I, as I alluded to at the beginning of this, this election has been about Calgary and Edmonton. Um, I I don't think 150 police, new police officers, 150 <laughs> social workers is going to be enough for the city of Calgary, let alone the province. Yeah. Um, I know it's a first step and the hardest part of any journey is the first step. Does this go far enough, do you think? I mean, I'm no public safety expert, um, but I will say I, you know, <laughs> but you're once abundant again, I, now. <laughs> I know, right? I get to have an opinion about it anyway. Uh, yeah, the city of Calgary does also do really good work here. And I think this is another way you could really extend an interesting olive branch to municipalities and say, you know, you know your communities, you know, crime is an issue, you know better than anyone else that's causing the crime. And so instead of telling them, you know, this is our solution, we're giving you 100 police officers you don't need, but like working with those municipal leaders on a strategy, I think would be a great approach to this for the NDP. Okay, um, so uh, I, we will be right back after a quick break. Uh, just we have to get ready for our next segment, so we'll be right back after a quick second. Welcome back, and now we're going to be turning to the uh, other three parties that are sort of major parties because there's a lot of independents running. There's a lot of uh, first-time parties running, but I want to focus on the three parties that have kind of been staples in Alberta politics, the Alberta Green Party, the Alberta Liberals, and the Alberta Party. I want to start with the Alberta Party, and we're just going to do basically a quick synopsis of their campaign, of their platforms. Uh, but for the Alberta Party, leader Barry Morris is running in Brooks Medicine Hat against uh, uh, leader Danielle Smith for the UCP. Um, I've read over the platform. He does address uh, municipalities by name, like the actual word municipalities in the uh, uh, party platform. And then he does also talk about, in the party platform, I shouldn't say he, but the party does talk about uh, health care, does talk about a little bit of crime. It's very light on infrastructure, though. Again, I don't see, I don't know why, but it seems like that's very a topic that no one wants to talk about. Um, Jen, for you, was there any overarching uh, uh, things that stood out for you for the Alberta Party? Yeah, I think, you know, the Alberta Party is interesting because they've always been actually pretty strong in policy. I felt like, even though they're not always, you know, there with winning seats, they always they tend to have like pretty good platforms. So, you know, I will say, I, I appreciated the attention to detail they had in here. Um, you know, I appreciated they kind of, they leaned into 
looking at health from a more holistic perspective, which I liked. Like they had some inspirational mental health there and like the opioid crisis. And I, I think that would really speak to municipalities. Um, I wish they'd highlighted a bit more actually, because I think it set their platform apart. Um, yeah, that was really what stood out for me. Again, I, I wish we could dive more into it, but they aren't running a full field of candidates. They're running uh, a, a 13 candidates across the province. Understandable. They want to focus on certain writings that they're hoping to pick up in this election. Yeah. Um, we'll see what happens uh, for the Alberta Green Party, who is running a typically more stronger campaign than we have traditionally seen with the Alberta Greens. Um, uh, leader John uh, Jordan Wilkie is running up in Edmonton, Rutherford. Uh, he has a very large uh, group of candidates running here in the city of Calgary. There's a few rural communities uh, who are, are rural candidates who are running. Um, I looked at this platform. Um, it had some substance, but not in-depth substance. It had things that they were going to prioritize and do, but it wasn't, here's how we're going to fix it. For you, uh, uh, Jennifer, what do you think about this platform? Yeah, I think they could uh, they could benefit from some for some more detail, and I think just some more focus. You know, I find with the the Green Party, um, I expect them to be like a party that addresses climate change, <laughs> and I think that's a bit of an elephant in the room. Like we haven't even talked about it in this conversation, but you know, none of these parties are talking about climate change, and like we alluded to earlier, part of the province literally on fire, and <laughs> it hasn't come up. You know, and I, and I, I find that yeah. fascinating because Alberta municipalities and the rural municipalities of Alberta didn't bring up climate change as well. And I'm not sure if that's just an oversight or if there was the three pressing issues that they want to focus on more, but you're right. It, it's a topic that we should be talking about because we literally have a portion of our province on fire right now. And it's yeah, not a topic exactly. that we're talking about. Yeah. And, so I think the Green Party, yeah. like I would expect them to lean into that a bit more and fill the gap. And I didn't see that as much as I hoped. They, they they did run on proportional representation. That was a big thing that they did talk about beforehand, but it seemed to just fall by the wayside. I'm not sure how that yeah. relates to municipalities, but um, again, the platform links are in the show notes for all these platforms as well. Um, the last party I want to talk about who kind of uh, has kind of been in a weird place over the last four years since their leader, David Kahn, left, now leader John Ragavan, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, I apologize. Um, who is uh, who? Who outlined their platform is quite interesting. It has some policy platforms. It has some uh, priorities for them as government. They're basically asking the people of Alberta to put their trust in them. Um, they're talking about healthcare. They're talking about some infrastructure. And they're, they are talking about crime and mental health. Um, they do hit it, but do they go into depth? I, I wouldn't say as much as some of the other parties as well. Mm -hmm. Would you yeah, agree? Yeah, agreed. I think, you know, I struggle with in the same way I struggle with the Green Party is kind of what's your focus? And I think, you know, we could look at the UCP and the NDP and kind of say, okay, this is like what you're focusing on. And then these are your other priorities. And often with election platforms, you have them right at the top, you know, it's like one, two, three, these are what we're focused on. And I feel like the Liberal Party, it's kind of like, we're, we're going to do the things that government does. It doesn't seem like there's necessarily like something they're advocating for. I'd like to see more vision, I guess, what I felt coming out of it, but it's very practical. Like they do have, you know, very reasonable things in here, but I think a bit more vision for their platform would be and it, it, it's sad yeah. because um, these parties haven't traditionally gotten the media coverage that the other two parties have because it really has become sort of a binary choice, either NDP or UCP. And I always say that is not the right answer. It's not a binary choice. There are many other parties running for this campaign uh, it, during this campaign. So you have multiple choices and make the best choice that you believe in for yourself. I want to turn okay. to sort of my last wrap up segment here because I know we're cautious of time and I want to ask you this, and it's kind of a very hard question to ask because I've been covering it for the last three weeks and I know you have, uh, I, I think you've watched a few of the episodes, but prior to watching my show and knowing about the Think Alberta Vote Local campaign, had you heard about this campaign from organizations, from websites, from uh, social media? Was this a campaign and even the uh, uniquely uniquely rural campaign that RMA posted, were these campaigns that you were even talking about? Or do you think people were talking yeah. about? I have to admit no. Um, and I, uh, I'm surprised because I do try to follow these things pretty closely. I was really familiar with like the city Calgary has their like YYC Matters campaign that I was following. 
um, pretty closely. Yeah, same thing. And what? It's just, <laughs> yeah, I'll send you the link, Chris. Okay. Um, but they don't get a lot of airtime. And I, uh, yeah, I think it's too bad because there's good stuff in here. Um, and maybe it's time for these communities to think about a bit more of, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say an advertising push, but, you know, how to get this into the narrative and how to get this in front of the people. Because I do think where this content is really useful is when you're talking to candidates um, or when you're, you know, getting a phone call from a volunteer and they want your vote. This is like a great tool to have in front of you. Do you think uh, May 30th, when everyone wakes up from Election Day, which I've told people Election Day is not going to end on May 29th, because I think it's going to go for a very long few days, as we've seen south of the, bo- yeah. south of the border. Yeah. Do you think a municipalities will be in a better spot after hearing what the party platforms are, hearing what the parties are pledging, that they can say, okay, we're, be- we're going to be able to work with party X on X, Y, and Z, and party b or z for a b and c issue or do you think municipalities are going to be in the exact same spot they were on april 30th when this election was about to be called because i i think they're screwed i I, i'm going to be completely blunt here because i'm a pundit as well i think alberta municipalities and and i say alberta municipalities as a whole and that's including the rural municipalities as alberta as well i think that municipalities did not or get did not get the attention that this election should have given them and i think municipalities are going to be uh in a weird spot on when the next ele- uh, government is sworn in because i don't think the pl- parties have a platform or an idea what they need to do for mm. municipalities Oh, yeah. I mean, I'd say Chris is feeling slightly more optimistic. I think, you know, definitely <laughs> coming coming out of this conversation, I think we kind of agree that what Alberta Muniz has tried to highlight hasn't necessarily come through from the platforms. Um, it's some, not all cases, but like generally, I, it's not like they're echoes of each other. So I do think in terms of policy, they have some advocacy work to do. Like they're going to have to get in front of a new government, whatever that looks like a new cabinet definitely um, and get these priorities in front of them and make sure they understand them. I will say though, why I'm a bit more optimistic is because what we've heard from leaders in municipalities is they want stability. Like that word came up so much when you were talking to their leadership. And I can't imagine how frustrating it would be for you know all this change. And like, you know, the cabinet was constantly changing and new leadership. And that must be just like crazy making when you're in that role. So like my hope is that they get some stability. They have, you know, one stakeholder who knows them, they build a relationship with them, they understand their files and they get that for a few years. So I I think they might be in a slightly better position, but um, yeah, that advocacy is going to be so critical. Well, uh, Jennifer, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and doing this. This has been uh, an enlightening, eye-opening conversation about the platforms and how it relates to uh, municipalities across Alberta. Um, So thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me, Chris. This was lots of fun. So uh, to our viewers, thank you so much for tuning in for and being part of this conversation. And now if you've enjoyed this conversation, please hit the subscribe button below uh, so you can stay up to date on all our latest interviews and special episodes. We have some amazing guests lined up and we can't wait to share their stories with you. Now, if you're able to, please consider, I'm going to make the shameless plug as I always do on these ending shows. Please continue. Uh, please uh, continue consider making a a small contribution to the show so we can produce more high quality content. Every little bit helps and we appreciate your support. A link to our Patreon account is in the show notes below. Now, don't forget to also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. A link to Jennifer's uh, Twitter will be in the show notes as well. So follow her because she will not, this is not a one-time thing for her. She'll be back on the show to continue to talk about politics on the show. Uh, And also, also, And this is my big final push. As much as we love our phones and technology, put down them for at least five minutes a day and go have real life in-person conversations, even if it's just for five minutes. And remember, election day is Monday, May 29th. Get out and vote. Please make your voice heard. And remember, do what you need to do to go and vote. If you do not vote, do not complain on Twitter for the next four years. Thank you again for watching another great episode of the Crossboard Interviews. Until next time, just keep talking.